Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'd like to invite the Sharpa to come forth and bless us as a night of music. As if to me, the invitation to the Spirit is itself sweet enough. And as if to me, the Lord hears prayers like that. Stay right here with us and fill us all up. You want to be filled up? Who wants to be filled up? 
How many of you want to stand up and say, Lord, I want to be filled to the full of the Spirit of the living God? Somebody next to somebody. Pray that prayer. Everybody close their eyes and somebody, either a neighbor or uh, your sister next to you or the elder who just everybody let's close our eyes and uh, say lord we are empty and it doesn't make any sense fill us we pray go right ahead pray Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Incline your ear to us. Grant us. Show us. Fill us to the full. With your grace in this place, on this day, in Jesus' holy, awesome, unstoppable name we pray. Amen. Be seated. I want to thank the church choir. I want to thank the power shower. I want to thank the Lord. And keep thanking him. And believe. Keep believing. Jacob and Rachel spouses. We talked about father and son. We talked about cousins. We talked about a mother in law and daughter in law who never met each other, but whose stories are for our benefit upon whom the ends of the earth are come. Today we talk about our husband and his wife. And we want to talk about transparency or otherwise. And we want to see where transparency really means something. We want to tell a love story according to its details. Because birds of a feather flock together. And when you consider this love story, you realize somewhat astonishingly, somewhat unnervingly somewhat awkwardly that birds of a feather end up together. We have seven words to remember the message by. And you can take these seven and run with them or you can take these seven and fight with them and win your own fight against yourself 
they sound kind of more compellingly pertinent to us today than some of the other summaries, some of the other sayings of the day. Quitting is not your option. How many words is that? You can start counting again. Quitting is not your option. How many words is that? You need two more. Where are the other two? They are in the hand and the heart of God. Grace is. Quitting is not your option. Grace is. Quitting is not your option. Grace is. Preach the sermon, saints, over here. Sheep on my left. All of us are on Jesus' right. We settled that some time ago. I don't make the division. Jesus does. You're all sheep. On the left and on the right and in between. Preach the word. Quitting. All right, preach it, man. Everybody preach it together. Quitting is not your option. Grace is, now make it personal. Quitting is not my option. Grace is, O oh God of grace, within this place, instruct your children on this race. It doesn't last the day or week or two. It doesn't end until we get to you. And so we thank you for the grace that will sustain us all beyond this place. We thank you in Jesus' name. We've spoken about the fall, about humanity's original moral tragedy, Lamex and Enoch's responses. We concluded that grace is as old as grace is there to catch me before I ever start falling. Was there to catch us before we ever started falling. We talked about heredity, what Abraham passed on to Isaac. And I don't think it was some genetic heredity I think it was something Abraham decided to do for survival it was behavior you know is it nature or nurture and this was nurture watch daddy lie of course it was not Abraham's intention I'm sure to teach his son to be a consistent and professional liar. Don't even know how well he knows Isaac learned it. What example are you setting for the Abimelechs of the world? Seventh day Adventist, Nairobi, Kenyan, or wherever else you may be visiting from Central Church. Or otherwise, what are you teaching the Abimelechs of your world? People who knew I was coming here told me all kinds of awesome and impressive and wonderful things. I should have been intimidated. I still came. All the significant and important people who are part of the congregation you are going to. I have a question for you. There are important people in your life of important roles. What are you teaching them? Now, I, I was also told that you have a history of good Guyanese. I shouldn't have come because that would spoil the history. They tell me that you had a Supreme Court just named, um, Chief Justice named Cecil Miller. And they say he was Guyanese. And uh, so... Uh, I hope you can think better by thinking of him rather than 
of me. Question, what picture of God are we giving? Are we taking advantage of the general truth that God sends his rain and sunshine without regard to character? Instead of believing, I'm doing fine, I don't need to fix anything because God is blessing me. God blesses because that's his nature. And you say it all the time. That's new to me. Everybody says God is good all the time. All the time God is good and they stop there. I hear you saying because that's his nature. So the fact that you live and move and have your breathing, the fact that I travel here or go there, the, the, it, it is not proof that we are perfected in holiness and ready for the coming of the Lord. It is proof that God is long-suffering. Am I fooling myself with the fact that God does have special care for those who honor him? He says that for Samuel 2.30, those who honor me, I will honor. So sometimes we end up believing, oh, he is honoring me because I honor him, and I don't need to fix anything. Well, maybe if you honored him better, he would be able to bless you more amply. What are we teaching our children? My kids were kids. They aren't kids anymore. But we brought our kids up to relate to reality. They were little, four and two, when I was gone for weeks at a time on some itinerary or other or sometime mommy had to go out somewhere and of course their love for mommy or daddy can be quite consistently dependent on mommy or daddy's leaving they don't love you as much when you are all in the house. But if you have to go, they want to cry and cry. And we realized that a practice among us, around us, was to design some subterfuge so that daddy could disappear and the kid doesn't really know daddy is gone. Or mommy could slip out while you distract the kid. And we realized that that was, at least we became convinced that that was a dubious practice. And it wouldn't be part of our parenting if daddy has to go. Lavon and Lloyd understand that daddy has to go. They can come out to the porch and cry while the taxi is picking him up. Or if he's just walking out, they can weep all they want. Daddy has to go. Mommy has to go. Mommy has to go. Deal with it. And quit sneaking away as if you are culpable. Or as if they can't live with reality. I wonder how many daddies and mommies there are out there. Anyway, we summarized Abraham is good but only Jesus then this morning it was the women's turn, Sarah and her daughter-in-law, whom she never met. And we saw that victory is for everybody, even for Sarah. We didn't, at least I didn't, like the expression at first. Then we realized that the even was not belittling. God was saying that when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed the year the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power, no parallel known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again 
What's our next move? We're going to the husband and wife team. Jacob and Rachel. I want to start with a text from the book of Jacob. Chapter 1. Starting with verse 1. And you will have to listen. Because none of you owns this book. The book of Jacob. Chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Be'el Roy. His name was Jacob. Now. Jacob was a perfect man. But people could not believe that. Especially Bible translators. This was mainly because they knew he was a small time crook and a big time fraud. But also perhaps because they believe some people are superior to other people. Jacob therefore could not act Actually, be perfect although the Bible said so and when interpreters encounter this same word describing other things and people they translated it perfect as in the case of Job the same word describing Job as perfect when it comes to Jacob the interpreters have tried to find some other way to translate it because it does not make sense to claim that Jacob was perfect. So we have to translate it some other way. And of course, they align theologically. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't work out as exploitatively as I suggest it, it, it does. But there's something I find suspicious about the only time in the Bible when they don't want to translate it perfect is when it describes Jacob. The issue before us today is why don't people like Jacob? Rachel did. And Rachel was not new to gender, or else you would feel strong desire to say Rachel was a thing of beauty. We're going to look at both of these characters. But let's start with a man. You know, the ladies are always first. Ladies first, ladies first. So let's, let's go with the man this time. In any case, it ain't no privilege to be this man. He, he, he wasn't much of a man. At least not at first. His twin brother was a man. A real man with hair and medals all over his chest. The medals were for shooting arrows straight in the Olympics. And the hair was for walking around with his shirt unbuttoned because somebody told him that women are into hair. And maybe the hair was working because he had three women living in his house before his twin brother Jacob could step out on his first date. supposed to be talking about Jacob but that was mostly about Esau Let, let's talk about Jacob what do we know about Jacob we know that he strangled hairy Esau out of the birthright Esau comes in from hunting whether he has game or not he hasn't been able to eat and he says I'm famished I'm about to die he thinks it's an argument that will calm Jacob down. But it's an argument that excites Jacob. All the better. <laughs> so Jacob throttles him and won't let him go until he's... Okay, okay, you can take the best way. Okay, okay. You can eat some food. What else do we know about Jacob? He lied to his father. I am Esau. <laughs> I don't know what his voice sounded like. But I kind of associate the battle-chested Esau with a bass baritone and Jacob with a, a tenor or something. So when he goes in and Isaac can't see and uh, he has to say that he is not who he is, he can't just say, I am Esau. He tries to sound a little deeper so it comes out, I am Esau. What else do we know about Jacob? He only left his mother's house when he had to run for his life. Anything else? Well, 
he ran off to his mother's place where her relatives lived. His relatives through his mother. And he met her brother Laban, the ultimate scoundrel. And he outwitted him too. More than once. Then there's the part that we referred to already. Genesis 25, 27. Where instead of saying he was a perfect man, they say he was a plain man. Or a peaceful man. Or a quiet sort. But the word they are working with is the Hebrew word tam. Tam is from tamam, which means complete, which is rendered blameless. And it's in association with the word yashar, which usually is translated upright, just, honest, perfect, peaceful. All of these things are characteristics associated either with tam or tam and yashar. An attribute or attitude that reflects genuineness and reliability. So which one of all of those words do you find in Genesis 25-27? Just honest, perfect, genuine, reliable, describing Jacob? Okay, here's the question. What is Genesis 25-27 all about? Look at it. It's just one verse. Verse 27 of chapter 25. And it's in the first book of the Bible. So it's not only Genesis 25, it's also Bible 25. Genesis 25 is the first 25th in your Bible. Because Genesis, you got it? Genesis 25, 27. What do you find? Huh? A mild man. Okay. What is Genesis 25, 27 all about? What does the verse actually do? It compares two people. Right? Who are the two people? Esau and what do we know about Esau? Esau was a great hunter. What does that mean? It means that he smelled of sweat. And he could shoot an arrow straight. And he had women in the house with him. Because he was the macho man. He was the real man. If it sounds like sexism, it's because it's Esauism. Factual Esau. Esau the great hunter. By the way, where have you in your reading of the Bible encountered the reference before to somebody being a great hunter? If you read your chapters in order, you should read chapter 10 before you get to 25. And Genesis 10, 8 and 9 are about Nimrod, the great, the founder of Babylon, father of the city with the greatest heathen name in human history God to this day wants us to relate to that name as the expression of the summit and totality of satanic device of natural and supernatural rebellion against God's rule on earth Babylon Nimrod the mighty hero hunter Pursuing prey for the sake of personal thrill or hunger or the survival of his kids. Or more likely, something different. Genesis 10 doesn't look like it's talking about Nimrod surviving. It's like a matter of greatness is what is being focused on here. And he was so great that he was in God's face. When it says before the Lord, it doesn't mean he went to church. This is in your face, God. I am Nimrod. When you look at his city, Babylon, in the light of its role in salvation history, it helps you to understand that the phrase before the Lord doesn't mean in worshipful, worshipful respect in the presence of the Lord. Nimrod 
stands at the head of a line that stretches to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that we recognize as glimpses by heaven into the rebellion that started in heaven and made its way to earth. When I say Nimrod, you hear the name of the forerunner of multiple human manifestations of the power of the original contender against all good. Why do you think that these depictions in Isaiah and Ezekiel are depictions of rulers? And you read about it and then you realize all this takes us from the natural to the supernatural plane. When it talks about I will ascend above the clouds. I will sit on the congregation in the sides of the north. If you know your Canaanite mythology, which of course is their religion. We say it's a myth. I think I heard Pastor JB say that this morning. We think these things are myths. That was their church. Their religion. And in their religion, the assembly of the gods, the pantheon of the Canaanite gods, was where Isaiah 14 says, this being says, I'm going to sit up there, Mount Zaphon. So you realize, oh, this has moved up. There's a supernatural element here. Why do you think Satan is given to us through these depictions of human rulers? Why? Because in human rulers, he has the best chance of showing what he is all about. All about power and control and manipulation and people doing what I say. And we think these guys are kings, so they must be great. You should read the book of Daniel, where Daniel has to acknowledge that God sets up on the throne the basest of men. Whoever is teaching the stewardship can tell you that. God is giving everybody a chance. And sometimes the person at the top is an example of dignity and decency. And sometimes the person with a power is a person of shame, disgrace, scandal, awkwardness. You turn your face or cover your ears rather than listen to what the ruler says. And Genesis 25, 27 informs us that Jacob, that Esau, sorry, that Esau was like this guy, Nimrod. You read your Bible and uh, you believe, or oh, it's the word of God, so it needs to be fair, so you get all the sides of a story before you decide how to conclude. Why? Because you're a Christian and you want to be fair. Well, the other side of the Jacob story is Rachel. Once you get out from the other side of the Jacob story is Esau. But somewhere along the line, you have a journalist friend. And any good journalist will tell you how important it is to get all sides of the news story and to do it in such a balanced even-handed way that nobody can even imagine which side they are on shut the door as mary was trying to enter last night don't make any judgments come to any conclusions those are the facts if the cops want to investigate they, we're journalists we just state facts tom shot Dick and Harry at 3 a.m. tomorrow. There was a coup d'etat in Timbuktu on uh, February 30. Uh, Eliud Kipchoge has set a new world record in the marathon. School scrappers are selling very fast this Christmas. Mary and Martha got married in Mombasa last week, Monday. That's the news. You're into fairness and they are into objectivity. They don't choose sides. They just give reports. But you are a Christian, so you think that you have to end up on some side or other. I got news for you. The Bible is not 
your standard. Either in print or digitally. The Bible had better be your standard. But it is not your standard. The Bible is not trying to show that God, the devil, decency, immorality, anarchy, and chaos are all very interesting options. So God does not have to be fair as you, as you judge fair or objective as the journalist judge object, judges objectivity. When Moses takes up his word processor, he is neither idle nor propagandizing. He just knows whose side he is on. When Moses texts, he texts for God against evil. Moses Nimrod in God's face and his Jacob Versus Esau descriptions belong in that context. And scripture's bias does not evaporate when Moses goes up Mount Nebo. Malachi and Paul do not speak for the sake of political correctness. God loves Jacob. God hates Esau. God will destroy Esau. And Babylon is coming to nothing too. Revelation 18.21 no matter how inaccurate or inappropriate we may figure God's language to be, it isn't we who from eternity to eternity have existed and have the long view. What is God talking about through Malachi and Paul? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about God saving everybody possible, Jew. Gentile. That's the message of Romans. Everybody's doomed. Everybody's damned. Everybody in Eldoret and Mombasa and Nairobi and next door as well. Everybody from everywhere and everybody else from everywhere else. Everybody's lost. And everybody has hope in Jesus. Everybody has a chance. It isn't one way for the Jew and another for the Muslim and another for the Guyanese and another for the Kenyan. Is that what your Bible says? This is what my Bible says. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God. And one mediator between God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. And Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. Somebody figures God can't just love Jacob and despise Esau and dump on Nimrod's Babylon like that. Yeah, that's because we think he's one of us. We can't do that. No? God has been spending all of creation history bringing forth in us the desire and the effort to do what's best for our own selves. To will and to do of his good pleasure. It's good for us. It's good for the entire universe. His eyes, Second Chronicles 16.9, go to and fro throughout the whole, throughout the whole earth. So he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Salvation is neither genome project nor Olympic sprint. It isn't who's your daddy or could you run faster than Kip? Kano in 1960. That, those are not God's questions. In salvation, Mr. Hare has no advantage over Ms. Tortoise. Everybody is the ugly duckling that turns into the gorgeous swan. Everybody is the beast kissed by the prince who turns out to be a beauty. Nothing before and nothing beyond that. Now, Rachel hasn't met this guy yet who is the scoundrel and the thief and perfect she's never seen him before she's just going to the well because it's time for her sheep to drink water Jacob knows Rachel is Rachel because he's had a conversation before she arrived and the people tell him who she is. So Jacob meets Rachel. Knowing Rachel is Rachel. Rachel meets Jacob. With no idea who he is. So when they meet. At 
the well, Jacob helps Rachel's sheep to drink while his eyes are drinking in the shepherdess. Uh, how does the Bible introduce the shepherdess? We already know the Jacob character. What about the shepherdess? Number one, she's Jacob's first cousin. Genesis 29, 10. She is the law, she, she's the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother. What else? She can move quickly. She runs home when she eventually finds out who Jacob is. She's his uncle's younger daughter. She has an older sister. She is beautiful of form and face. She is more than her big sister. What else? She is worth working seven years for voluntarily. Jacob says, I will work seven years for Rachel. Ah. What else? She is mixed up with deception. The first record that we have is her father's doing. And she may be a victim, just like Jacob. You know the story. On Jacob's wedding night, the father gives him. That's why when we do weddings, we say, they take off the veil and say, you may kiss the bride. They didn't do that back then. So Jacob didn't know what he was getting until the sun came up. But that's not the only time she was mixed up with deception. And if she could get off and blame her father the first time, she can't blame her father this time. Genesis 31. You heard it in the scripture reading. She had stolen her father's gods. Well, they were clay things. Teraphim, the Hebrew calls them. And every family had its teraphim. And every town and city had its teraphim. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, he traveled north and west and he stopped in Haran. Well, he left because God had told him to leave. But the record says that he left along with his posse. His father was in, and once the father was there, the father was the head of the extended family. And the father decided to stop in Haran. And Abraham, out of respect, didn't go down to Canaan until after Terah, his father, had died. Why would his father find it attractive to leave Ur of the Chaldees and then stop in Haran? The same God was the head of the pantheon in Ur of the Chaldees and in Haran. So his father was still religiously comfortable. He was older and older, but he could still worship his God. Joshua tells us that he did. We're not just speculating. Joshua does not name the God. But Joshua says, our ancestors on the other side of the river, Euphrates, used to worship idols. God started something new with Abraham. I said every family had their teraphim, their gods. Then, you know, it's like the good luck charms or whatever. They would, by having them, they were secure from all alarms. They represented the wealth of the family. You could have sheep and goats and cattle. But the real representation of the wealth of the family was these gods. And Rachel, when Jacob said, let's go. Rachel collected the family gods and made off with them. Leah apparently wasn't as cute, nor apparently was she as devious. She and Rachel had both been victims. Laban had used up all their dowry money. He just had no respect for his own daughters in his passion for greed. Leah is not on record as doing anything about it. Rachel does something about it. She is a thief and she can be spiteful. She is so sly that even Jacob knew nothing about it. She is traveling with her husband Jacob and Jacob has no idea. 
she is so astute that scheming father Laban when he catches Jacob Jacob says search everything I don't know where you get the story from that we have your gods whoever you find it with kill them even though they're all my people whoever has your gods you can kill them and Rachel is so astute that scheming Laban doesn't find the gods even though he may end up knowing where the gods are yeah how would he know because he searched everywhere and the narrative suggests that eventually he went to Rachel's tent and he searched and he lifted up and turned over whatever he could Rachel was sitting down and not getting up she said I have my period no man in antiquity could do anything about that I have my periods dad so just bear with me I can't get up she was sitting on the gods I don't know if she was having a clay flow this time what else do you know about Rachel Jacob would die for her or work 14 years last seven were Laban's negotiating position he worked seven and then Laban violated the deal and he gets upset and Laban says okay you can work another seven if you really want her because we we don't marry the younger girl before we marry the older one that is not our practice Rachel is capable of jealousy chapter 30 verse 1 is the first time Rachel is ever jealous before that she was the queen she just floated above the storms her older sister knew that she was the favored one her father wouldn't let her go because he knew how much Jacob loved her he could use her as much as he wanted to manipulate Jacob because Jacob would die for her his line to Jacob Laban's line was his own answer to economic dynamics what did he say to Jacob well in effect what he said was you may love whoever you want We don't play by love here we play by power and I hold all the power I have Rachel I have employment I have a gang of sons you have nothing except your desire and your dignity you want to abandon your dignity and grovel and beg me you want to get upset and fight hit me I have a bunch of sons here what you got babies you have Leah and Rachel's children well at that point he didn't even have Rachel's children yet he didn't have any children it was within the first week of the wedding ceremonies you want to fret and fume and make no difference in the end or you'll just preserve your dignity pretend it's fine and meekly work with me seven more years because I have the keys I have all the cards including the jack the fool to play in your face so Jacob works seven more near years he gets exploited and he keeps going eventually he works for 20 years for a man whom who he says changed his wages ten times now this ten times thing is a Semitic statement. Job says the same thing. When they say ten times, it doesn't mean they are counting. Like when Nebuchadnezzar says, heat the furnace seven times hotter. Nebuchadnezzar has no thermometrical way of measuring that. What kept Jacob going? What kept 
Jacob going. We know what started it. Genesis 29, 15 to 18. Laban said to Jacob, you're my relative. Should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were very weak, were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. What started the story? It was love. What kept it going? More love? You won't find that in your text. There is no more reference to love in this text between anybody and anybody. Jacob loved Rachel. It never says Leah loved Rachel or Leah and Rachel loved their daddy or their daddy loved his daughters. Maybe we should look for something else. We mentioned that Genesis says that Jacob was Tom, 25, 27. But given what we know it means, we don't really know what to do with it when the Bible says Jacob was that. It works in Job. But especially because it works in Job, it is harder for us to apply it to Jacob. We think, you know, God must have been kind of confused when he said the same thing about Job and Jacob. Why would God have lost it, tell me, when he called Jacob perfect. What else do you know about Jacob besides his lies, his theft, his weird genetic engineering you heard about in the scripture reading? Is that how babies are born? If you put a, uh, if you put a mask of Leal Caesar's face in front of them, when the mother conceives, then the baby will come out looking like Leal. Jacob had these sticks and he would peel the sticks half Half, half, leave some of the stick looking white because the bark is off and some of it looking dark so that it's speckled. And so he would put it in front of the rams mounting the sheep and then the sheep would conceive and they would bear speckled cattle. Is that how genetics works in Kenya? But that part of the story climaxes by saying Jacob got a lot of goats and a lot of sheep. I hope we can make the connection with Abraham. We do not thrive and prosper because we are smart. We thrive and prosper because God is generous. And the ignorance of our practice doesn't gainsay the generosity of our God. And sometimes the two run together and we don't know which it is. So we say, it's me. It is me and my genetic engineering. Is there anything else to know about Jacob? Something along with his cheating and scheming that makes him more relevant to people in this church right here this evening, to our daily life, to our hope of heaven. What was Jacob's cheating and scheming about anyway? Here's the breakdown. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 178 and 179. Jacob was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which the birthright would confer. It was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing to commune with God as the righteous Abraham to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family to be the progenitor of the chosen people and of the promised Messiah and to inherit the immortal possessions embraced to the blessings of the covenant. Here were the privileges and honors that kindled his most ardent desires. Jacob may have been a scoundrel and a thief, but he really loved 
you, Jesus. You know anybody like that? Every two minutes, I'm banging my head against the wall because I've been a fool again. And God, you know I don't want to do it again. And I do it again. But, Je but Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. Have mercy on me. Continuing the quotation, while he thus esteemed eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. Let's go to the end of the book of Jacob. Oh, okay, near the end. Chapter 20, instead of 21 or 22. You know it as Genesis 48 and 49. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said, they are my sons, whom God has given me here. That's in Egypt. So he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Patriarchs and Prophets 2.34 Jacob's eyes were dim with age and he had not been aware of the presence of the young men but now catching the outline of their forms he said who are these? On being told he added bring them I pray thee unto me and I will bless them. As they came nearer the patriarch embraced and kissed them, solemnly laying his hands upon their heads in benediction. Then he uttered the prayer, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. There was no spirit of self-dependence, no reliance upon human power or cunning now. God had been his preserver and support. There was no complaint of the evil days in the past. Its trials and sorrows were no longer regarded as things that were against him. Memory recalled only God's mercy and loving kindness. Who had been with him throughout his pilgrimage. And then chapter 49. He brings all his sons together. To tell them. What will befall them in the days to come. At the last. Quote. Patriarchs and Prophets 235. All the sons of Jacob. Were gathered together about his dying bed. Often. And anxiously. He had thought of their future. Now as they waited to receive his last blessing. The spirit of inspiration rested upon him. And before him, in prophetic vision, the future of his descendants was unfolded. 236, Jacob had ever been a man of deep and ardent affection. His love for his sons was strong and tender and his dying testimony to them was not the utterance of partiality or resentment. He had forgiven them all and he loved them to the last. His paternal tenderness would have found expression only in words of encouragement and hope. But the power of God was upon him and under the influence of inspiration he was constrained to declare the truth. However faith painful. How does the ultimate fraud turn into the holy man of God? Speaking as moved by the Holy Ghost. I think we know. I think we know the answer. We just don't believe the answer. We know the answer is not Jacob. And we also know the answer is not Rachel. We even know that the answer is not 
Job. Job will never be better than Jacob or better than you or better than even me. The only better is the same who is the only good. There is none good but one. That is God. The answer is God, my friends. And Jacob gets the answer because all through his tumbling and tripping and falling and sinking and drowning all his failing and dying through all of it he kept coming back up again he just kept coming back up again because he knew what God wants you to know even if it's the first time you're hearing it today quitting is not your option The righteous falls seven times and gets up again. You're talking Jacob, folks. That's faithfulness too. Faithfulness to a dream. Faithfulness to a conviction. That victory over sin is not a figment of imagination. Blameless is not hyperbole. Faithfulness to belief in a God who knew what he was saying when he said, My grace is all you need my grace is stronger in your infirmities whether they be physical or spiritual or intellectual or social that's what even Sarah means we apply it spiritually but God says it initially to show that there is no physical limitation on God so why should we put spiritual limitations on him we need to understand that it is the accuser of the brethren who wants to crush our spirit and the devil will tell us you're a dirty scoundrel you're nothing more than a smother of filth like Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3 that is his work Jesus work is to shut him up and send him scuttling away to the hot place and to remind you that quitting is not your option Grace is, you're going to believe Jesus or you're going to believe the devil? You're going to believe the father of lies or you're going to believe in grace? Grace, my sister, grace, my brother, is all you need. You can celebrate Enoch and Daniel and Job as they say in Ezekiel, all you want. You can love Job and Daniel and Enoch. But get this, Hebrews 11, 21. So this is the book of Jacob, final chapter. Find it, just read it for yourself. Hebrews 11, 21. This, this is, oh, like tear-jerkingly awesome. Hebrews eleven twenty one. By faith, Jacob worshipped. As he was dying. Isn't that how you want to die. People of God. In the end. Life is a potpourri. The cravings of the flesh. The longings of the spirit. Humanistic optimism. Divine ideals. We throw them all together. And we come up with something. And we think it's okay. Except that Jeremiah says. You are totally incapable. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps consider the heart it is above all things deceitful and desperately wicked you yourself don't know it i don't know your names i don't know your stories but the god you long to serve knows stories including yours i know stories of kids mixed up with desire and human strategy in one place where i taught the guys would come to school they would come to school from wherever they came from and after a month or two or three 
some man from the village would come to the school and ask for so and so because when they got to school they had enough for one month's rent and after the first month's rent they didn't have any money left and they kept promising the man uh, 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 making up stories uh, you know you'll get it yeah. and so the second month goes by and uh, the third the man can't find them he has no idea of course it doesn't necessarily matter to him either he has no idea that some of these boys are eating once a day if they get some food somewhere but they want to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ that's what they come to school for that's what they register for theology for lying I wanted to say lying to hell but it would sound too bad and it really wasn't the way they wanted to go lying through their teeth but they want to serve Jesus like Jacob the only thing that will destroy you is quitting don't quit. Quitting is not your option. Grace is. Don't quit. Don't quit. I don't care how many times you've already messed up and you know and even somebody else, I don't know who they be, also knows that you are a mess. Don't quit. Quitting is not your option. The only thing that will destroy you is quitting, is giving up, is saying, I can't make it. That is Satan screaming in your soul. Don't quit. Grace is all you need. Grace is all you need. Quitting is not your option. Grace is. We thank God for his word. To end the day, we shall do our theme song from your bulletins or song number 462 from the SDA hymnal. And we shall do stanzas one and chorus only. Chorus two. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. O oh, what a fortress of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please let us be seated for a moment as I invite the chairman of the camp meeting committee to come up front and give us an update.